Hello, and welcome to episode 65 of the Talk Witchcraft podcast. In this episode, Maggie and I will discuss what it means to be bold and how you can become a more confident and courageous person. We will also provide tips for living life bravely and taking action in the face of fear. You're listening to Talk Witchcraft. On this podcast, we talk about witchcraft as a lifestyle and discover how to merge magic into your daily life. Every week, we'll demystify witchy topics like tarot, astrology, crystals, herbs, and more as you develop your personal brand of magic and create the life of your dreams. We're We're your hosts, hosts, the the Mystic Mystic Sisters, Sisters, Erica and Maggie. In this segment of the show, we choose a tarot card for the week, and we look for moments that relate to this card in our daily lives. For this episode, we chose the Two of Wands, and the theme of this card is planning for action. In this card, you can see a figure is planning, and you can tell he's planning because he's inside of a castle representing safety and security. He's looking out over the land. There's houses on the hillside. There's mountains and water in the distance, and he's at this high point taking in the view collecting all the information that he can as the plan is coming together. He's also facing away from the camera, so to speak, which means he's forward thinking. He's not looking inside his home. He's looking out beyond the walls. In a way, it reminds me of Princess Jasmine, where this is a wealthy person with all they could ever need inside these walls, but they still long to go outside the safety of the castle to see the world. And in the image, he's holding a globe, which not only indicates his interest in seeing everything and traveling the world, it also shows that there's still a lot of potential for where he's going to go because he has a map of the entire world rather than a map of the specific area. It's sort of like saying the world is your oyster. He's also dressed for travel. He's wearing a cloak and has his hat and boots on. This isn't the outfit of someone who's staying in. He's ready to go see the world. So I think an important distinction here is that this is still a person who's forming a plan and they've likely made the decision to travel far away or take some action of some sort, a new business or a new relationship. This is not a card of moving now. It's a card of moving soon. Exactly. So do you have a story about making plans or being reflective or starting something new? This card to me, it's always present. So you make the plan and then you take action on the plan and then there's a new plan and then you have to take action on that plan. And so you're always coming back to the plan to make, take action on the plan. So that's how I feel about my garden. Last year, I built the raised beds. I started it. I figured out what the sun's movement was like. I planned out my square foot gardening. I learned some things about that you can't always believe the books because, you know, zucchini are really big plants and my tomatoes went completely batshit crazy and grew to heights I never dreamed possible. Your tomatoes were crazy last year. <laughs> it was nuts. I don't know. <laughs> and so, you know, now the plan is, okay, I'm going to expand one more. And I have a plan to build a third raised bed and I'm going to plant some vegetables that I've never grown before. Like I've got broccoli this year and um, cauliflower I've never done, Brussels sprouts I've never done. So I've got these plants for these new crops that I've never done before. And we also have a plan to put together a whole indoor herb garden near our kitchen that we can use year round. I'm looking out at the world of all of the vegetables that I'm growing. We've been joking a little bit that this is our victory garden because of all the things that are happening in the world that we're going back to World War II and doing our victory garden so that we don't have to ship in the vegetables as much. I've always planned on learning how to do some canning so that I can have those vegetables for the winter months. I feel like there's these big lofty goals and plans for the garden, but I have to implement them slowly. Yeah. And the plan's always like shifting and changing as you get used to one thing, you can add more or choose something different. That is if something didn't work. 
I've grown zucchini and squash in my garden every year. I like to eat it on occasion. It's not my favorite vegetable. I don't like that it squeaks when you bite into it. It's just a weird sensory thing that I have. I've never noticed that it squeaks <laughs> before. Now I'm probably going to in zucchini no. for me. <laughs> And they grow so fast. Like they could be like little itty bitties and you're like, I'll leave it for one more day. And then you come back and it's this giant zucchini and you have to make like four loaves of zucchini bread out of it. I'm making the decision and it's it's really hard, which is why I'm struggling to say it. I probably am not going to grow a zucchini or a squash in my garden this year. I think it's going to be okay. <laughs> You don't have to grow everything. Also, you are growing everything. You have like 500 seeds started. <laughs> it's true. I do. But that's for Kim's plan, which yes. is to sell what we don't put in our garden, right. which I think is a great plan. <laughs> it is a great plan. <laughs> what about you, Maggie? I don't make plans. And sometimes it bites me in the butt because it would be better if I had a plan. But sometimes it turns out really good. So when this card shows up for me, I usually know that it's very important to make a plan and to not do things by the seat of your pants. Fly is it flying by the seat of your pants? What's the saying? Yeah, I think I think that's it. And if it and if it's not, that's fine. But it fits for what I'm talking about right now because as a Gemini, I'm very airy. So it's always just like wherever the wind takes me, flying by the seat of my pants versus like taking action in a measured way, like some of the other elements. So I guess one thing that I do every week is when we plan out these episodes. It really helps to have the structure already created to fill in what needs to be done, where, what we're talking about, and the way that we've structured the year around the Zodiac seasons is a plan to help us know what to talk about. And Erica and I, at the beginning of each Zodiac season, we decide you know, okay, so here's the things that you can do to make the most of the Zodiac season. So what are the things that we want to talk about more in like a full length episode? And so we make that plan and that really helps to take action and make sure things get done and make sure that we're not feeling like confused or lost about what are we going to talk about next? Because we already know, and we know that it's going to be related to the energy of that Zodiac sign. I do see the benefit of planning and I know that it actually makes things get done because there's other things that I do that don't end up getting done because I didn't create a plan for it. So. <laughs> So let's get into our main topic for this episode. As we mentioned, we are going to be talking about being bold today. So what does it mean to be bold, Erica? When most people think of the word bold, they might think of someone who is daring and fearless. But what does it really mean to be bold? To be bold is to be courageous, daring, and confident. It means taking risks and facing life head on and being motivated and impulsive as you take on new challenges. If you want to live a life that's truly your own, you need to be bold. Boldness can be defined as having the courage to take action, being motivated, and also being impulsive. It's what allows you to face life head on and to take risks. So in order to be bold, you have to be comfortable with who you are. You need to be confident in your abilities and know that you can handle whatever comes your way. So a lot of this comes from the things that we've talked about before, like being authentic. You can revisit that lesson, knowing who you are, getting to know yourself. And that gives you this ability to be confident in these actions that you're taking. And there are many areas in life where being bold is important. For instance, since if you're unhappy with your current job, it might take some boldness to quit and pursue your dream career. In a relationship, being bold can mean speaking up for what you want or need. And it might also mean taking a chance on love, even if it means your heart gets broken. No matter what area of life that you're in, Remember that being bold doesn't mean being fearless. It's okay to be scared. There's a fear that comes up when you start a new romance or when you start a new job or when you're unsure about things that you're about to take action toward. It's okay to have that fear. And being bold means that you don't let the fear hold you back. So now let's talk about what are the benefits of being bold? There are many benefits to being bold. For one, it can help you to achieve your goals. When you're bold, you're more likely to take action and go after what you want. 
This can be especially helpful when it comes to your career. If you have a dream job, being bold can help you land it. Being bold can also help you build strong relationships. If you're bold, you're more likely to speak up for what you need or what you want. So this can make your relationships much more honest and authentic because you're telling somebody the things that you want out of the relationship. And it can also help you to attract the right people into your life. And again, these relationships, they're not always, you know, romantic. There's all sorts of different kinds of relationships, friendships, a relationship between a parent and a child, a relationship between siblings. And finally, being bold can simply make life more exciting. When you're not afraid to take risks, life can be more fun and thrilling. You get to experience new things and have new adventures. So if you're ever feeling stuck in a rut, remember that being bold can help you break out of it. And when it comes to this, taking risks and all of that, having new experiences and new adventures, being bold is good to help you, like Erica said, get stuck out of the rut. At the same time, there's still some like caution to take to be. So now that you know what it means to be bold and the benefits of being bold, it's time to start living your life more boldly. And we'll share a few tips for how you can be more bold. How many times are we going to say that word in this episode (laughs) after we draw our self-care card? All right. So our self-care card today comes from My Quality Time Self-Care Activity Book by Deja Osborne. And you can go to her website. It's Deja Drewit, I think is how you pronounce her last name. It's D-E-J-A-D-R-E-W-I-T.com. Maggie got me these for my birthday or Christmas, some present. That your birthday and Christmas are at the same time, so. So today we have a woman in a white dress. She is sitting at a desk with a cup of tea and um, she is sitting at a writing desk, writing a postcard with candle lit. It's a very witchy, ritualistic kind of image. And it is reach out. So they are encouraging us to send someone a postcard or handwritten letter. I think that that actually kind of goes with our tarot card too, about the thinking outward and into the world instead of staying at home. I don't know what I'll do for mine though. I mean, I guess I'll write somebody a letter. (laughs) Yeah, I will also write somebody a letter. I don't know who though. So that'll be, that'll be the fun in it. Trying to figure out who needs to get a letter from me. And now we invite you to participate with us in this self-care task of reaching out to people and talking about yourself in a letter form and asking questions of them and seeing if they write back as just a way to reflect on yourself and hey, it's a way to be bold because sometimes writing a letter is really hard to do and intimidating to put yourself out there like that. Yeah, especially if it's somebody that you haven't talked to in a while and you're trying to reconnect with them through something that's not so intrusive like a letter. All right, so here are some steps for how you can become more bold in your life. Start by taking small steps. If you're not used to being bold, it can be daunting to make big changes all at once. Start with small steps and work your way up. I am not a bold person. In fact, I've been called a timid person a time or two. I feel like, let me, let me, let me back up. I am very bold in certain areas of my life. And my home life is not a place where I like to be bold. It's a place where I can just not have to make the decisions and not have to be forceful and opinionated and bold. And so I think that this taking small steps piece is important for that. I can take small steps to be more decisive about my own things that I do in my home life. I've talked before about that mental block I have of not wanting to do or wanting to do things, but not initiating it. And so taking those small steps of if I have the thought of, I want to do something to actually like do it, to take that small, bold step. Bold is becoming one of those words where you say it so many times that it's like starting to lose meaning to me. And it's starting to sound kind of like a weird word, but yeah, I wouldn't describe myself as naturally bold. I think I have qualities that are associated with boldness. And so maybe it's just kind of a strange word. (laughs) 
<laughs> but I, yeah, I think taking small steps, especially if you're not usually somebody to be bold or be confident or be courageous or brave, what all of these words, taking one small step outside of your comfort zone is a good place to start. In my work life, I'm extremely bold. I've quit many jobs to start anew and because it wasn't comfortable or what I wanted and taking those leaps of faith into the unknown this last change that I made, I was holding back from even applying and interviewing for this job because I was like, it's just going to be more of the same. It's just going to be the somebody owning my time and my freedom and me having to work for them and follow their rules. And it ended up being the best job I've ever had in that work world. I have a lot of boldness, but I think that I could take some small steps to have some boldness in other areas. I think, and maybe that's even a better first step before taking small steps toward being bold, reflecting on where you already are bold and where you aren't so bold, because there's just different areas that we might feel more confident in ourselves than in other areas. I feel like I actually am bold. Well, I'm when it comes to like meeting new people or being in social situations where I have to like talk about myself, I don't think I'm bold. I wait for other people to approach me, ask me questions. I don't give information about myself without being prompted. Maybe that's the area that I can be more bold when I take these small steps because I think I come across as really confident because I put myself out publicly on the internet a lot, but it's totally different to be confident like with one-on-one you know when I'm I'm like sitting alone in my house filming reels you know so it's like easy to be confident when I'm in my element but like being outside of that space is totally a different feeling so the next tip for being more bold in your life is to find a support system and really just finding a support system for pretty much anything is helpful because anytime that you feel insecure or scared or fearful, having somebody to lean on is going to be beneficial. If you have a family member or a friend who you know will be supportive of you and you tell them, hey, I'm trying to be more bold in this area. Can you support me in this? Can you help me? And I think that you and I, Maggie, have lucked out in our parents in that they are a hundred percent supportive behind us in every endeavor we ever pursue. We have that privilege and I call mom about almost anything that is going on. I call you about almost anything that's going on. And I call dad usually for financial and car related things, but I could call him for almost anything. (laughs) You know, I've got my boyfriend and I've got my found family. My boyfriend in particular has been super supportive through all of the bold decisions I've had to make regarding my divorce and regarding my lifestyle change and my job change. He was there through all of that. Just having somebody with you, helping you, propping you up when you need it. Yeah. Well, cause it kind of gives you confidence when you can run an idea by somebody. If you're like, I want to do this, but I'm not sure especially if you're new, if you're taking these small steps toward being bold, having somebody else be like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. You should definitely try that. Or somebody who's going to be like, maybe that's not the right thing to do. Just giving yourself something to bounce ideas off of in your pursuit of being more bold. My husband is supportive of anything that I decide to do. Dana's just like, yeah, you should do that. Like no matter what it is. (laughs) Yeah. And sometimes, I mean, it's probably because he's a Sagittarius. So he's just like spontaneous and into any new ideas that's mostly good but then sometimes it gets us into trouble because we're both just like (laughs) you know I'm just like flying around wherever the wind takes me like I said before and he's like the wind (laughs) (laughs) except except he's fire so I guess to take this metaphor way too far (laughs) is like a raging fire that like has the wind moving on The third thing you can do is fake it till you make it. Even if you're not sure how to be bold, fake it until you are able to do it. Act like the person that you want to be and eventually it will become second nature. I'm thinking of the meme of Glinda from Wizard of Oz that says dress for the job that you want because I 100% would just wear Glinda's (laughs) pink dress every day if I could. Oh my gosh. (laughs) I love that dress. It's so pretty. It helps to curb that imposter syndrome or or maybe make it worse on in some ways, but just being like I can do this job. I can do this hobby. I can do this. I'm supposed to do it. 
this is who I am and what I'm supposed to be. I'm going to do it until I'm good at it. And I I have kind of like a love hate relationship with this phrase of fake it till you make it because it's like, well, you should fake it, but it, it makes sense because it's basically what it's really saying is like practice, just practice the thing until you figure it out. You're not going to be the best at something when you first try it out, but you can act in a way that you are good unless you're doing it unethically like I think that's where I have a problem with it is when somebody Mm -hmm. is like pretending that there's some expert in something and they're selling services in that way I think that's Mm -hmm. when it's unethical but if it's just for this purpose of like I want to be more bold when it comes to the way that I perform in my job or I want to be more bold when I'm meeting new people then you know that's not unethical it's almost like glamour magic really where you're putting on a mask of how you want to be perceived by other people eventually you become so used to the way people are perceiving you that you start to perceive yourself that way too. I am taking on a new role of a leader and a supervisor and a mentor, which I've always wanted. I've always wanted this opportunity. I know that it's good for me and it's what I want to do, but I've never done it before. And so having people come to me with questions and I need help and how do I do, and I don't necessarily know the answer. Those are those moments where I have to fake it until I make it. I have to tell, tell people, honestly, like, I don't have an answer for you right now. Give me a minute. It. Give me some time to look into this and I'll get back to you. And then following through with that or just kind of word vomiting until something smart comes out of my mouth. <laughs> I think it's really, really brave to be able to say that you don't know something too. Mm -hmm. I think recognizing that, like saying, I don't know the answer right now, but I will get back to you when I do. That does take bravery because we live in this world where it's like, you're expected to just be an expert in everything and be a master. And if you say something, you have to have read the entire history of that thing. (laughs) So that takes bravery and that's bold. Yeah. And my boss was just talking with me yesterday about the growth that I'm going to have to go through because I'm an Enneagram too. So I'm the helper and I want every, I'm a people pleaser. I want people to be happy. I want to help them get to a place of happiness, but in a service industry, learning that there are some people who just are unhappy. She was talking about, you know, apologizing for some, for things that you don't think you need to apologize for or standing up for the other providers who may or may not have done something wrong or I don't agree with and think maybe they should have done something differently, but backing them up when a parent is upset a hundred percent, all of those things take boldness and confidence and being sure of yourself without taking it personally. And those are all things that I'm going to have to fake it until they make it. And I'm going to probably have long conversations with my boss after my first couple hard conversations with parents where I'm crying it out because that's what I do. But in the moment, being strong and bold. And I think that kind of brings up the last point of being true to yourself, which I think it might be the most important part of being bold is that authenticity piece of being true. You know, knowing that even though you may be faking it in some ways, it's not a false representation of who you are. It's something that you're developing within yourself to be bold, not doing something that doesn't feel right just because you think it is what it would mean to be bold, making sure that you're always following your heart, being true to who you are. And that's that piece of getting to know yourself. You have to get to know who you are in order to project that boldness into the world. So we also just wanted to talk about some challenges that we might face when trying to be bold, some obstacles that might come up that prevent us from being daring, being confident. And so here are a few common things. So this is a big one for me, and it's the fear of what others may think or say that is not nice about me. (laughs) In order for anybody to be themselves and to live life boldly, we all have to learn how to overcome what other people might say about us and what they might say about our actions and our the way that we present ourselves to the world. Believe me, this is one of the hardest personal growth areas for me because I 
care way too much about what other people think. And I've known it for years and years and I'm working on it all the time and it never gets easier. Yeah. My favorite saying, I can't remember who said it. It's probably one of those things that have been tossed around in like the self-help industry and there's not really an origin, but it's that what you think of me is none of my business. Mm -hmm. And that has really helped me. It's so powerful because it's like, that's your opinion. It's being the dude, like, well, that's just like your opinion, man. <laughs> right. <laughs> because someone thinks something of you, it doesn't change who you are. Not letting that fear of what they're thinking and what they're saying. I mean, I have this fear all the time. I all the time on reels, but I have fun doing it. I have fun making these videos. And I know I'm sure there's like 20 somethings and teenagers who are like, who's this 30 year old who's like, actually, I'm almost 32. <laughs> who's like <laughs> doing these reels. Why is she on Instagram? She's way too old. But it's like, that doesn't really change anything because it's fun for me. It's a way for me to like express myself. And I don't care if if they think I'm embarrassing because I'm not embarrassed by it. So one of the breakthrough moments for me was I've had this conflict with this particular individual that I talked about before, where I really, really cared what they thought about me. I was happened to be reading the life-changing magic of not giving a fuck, which is that parody about Marie Kondo. I decided that this person was somebody that I couldn't give a fuck about anymore. And I couldn't care what he thought about me and that the things that they were devaluing in me were the things that I really truly value in myself by trying to appease this person to make them think better of me. I was diminishing myself. I decided that that's not something I can do anymore. And it was making every interaction awkward and unenjoyable for everybody involved. That was like the first like breakthrough moment of not caring what people think about me. (laughs) And it has made it so that you're able to enjoy time when this person has to be present by being with the other people who are around. And just being myself. And if they don't like it, then they can go eat glass, eat glass. (laughs) They can just die mad about it. (laughs) Yes. The second thing that might be a challenge or an obstacle for being bold, something that some people might have a hard time being bold is because they fear failure. And this is one that also affects me in a lot of ways. This is a big one that I've had to deal with because as a recovering perfectionist, a fear of failure has prevented me from doing a lot of things. Thinking that if you try something new and it doesn't work out, that's going to reflect on me as a person as like, that is my value. I did something and it didn't do well. So now some people are going to think of me badly, (laughs) which I guess goes back into the previous one. But what I've tried to learn and what I'm still learning, I think everything is just a constant learning process, especially when it's something that's so ingrained in you. But to remember that failure is a part of life. It's something that allows us to learn. You learn from your mistakes and it allows you to grow. You can improve upon it. If you've made a mistake, you can learn from that mistake and do better the next time. I see this all the time with my kiddos. And it's really sad when you see it in like a six-year-old. They have learned that the world is hard. They have also learned that when they don't perform well, when they fail, they get punished, you know, at school, you know, they, they don't get recess time because they didn't finish their work or they don't get good grades or just disappointment, just seeing the looks of disappointment from their parents and from their teachers. I see it all the time where they've completely shut down and they won't even try or attempt to take on something or answer a question because they're afraid that they're going to get it wrong. It's heartbreaking. And I try to instill the sense of like, be bold, take a guess because I don't know what they don't know. And I can't help them to learn it and know it unless they make an attempt. I don't know how often that gets across, especially with my six-year-olds, all of the growth mindset things of I can do hard things and I don't know that yet. Those kind of ways of thinking are really important. Yeah. Having at least one person hopefully will help them learn it before it's too much a part of how they think about themselves. I do a lot of testing. And so when kids hear the word test, they think percentage correct. 
which is not how my test works. They're, they're based on a bell curve. They're based on the same kind of scores as you would get from an IQ test. It's literally about what they know and what they can do in this snapshot point of time and not how many they get correct. That's what it should be. I know dad used to, I don't know, I don't know if he still does it, but I think he did at least we probably does. I don't know why he'd change it. If you don't know the answer to a question writing in, I don't know it right now, but I know exactly where to look to find the answer. And that would be counted as correct because the point is not to be able to memorize and like know things on the spot. Our brains aren't designed to remember. Our brains are designed to solve problems. And so giving them that opportunity to like, I mean, that's slightly different from what you're talking about with the assessment because it right. helps you yeah. to... <laughs> Well, it, it, yeah, it's, it's a little bit related because I, I, and I agree with that statement of like, I don't know the answer, but I know where to look it up is exactly how the real world operates. That was one of my frustrations in school is that I could see the, with my didactic photographic, whatever memory, I could see the literal page and the, how it was formatted and where exactly the line is with that, the answer to the question, but I couldn't pull the exact words of the sentence out of my brain, but I could tell you exactly which page it was on. And it frustrated me that I would get these answers incorrect when I knew where the information was. Right. And in the real world, when you're not in school anymore, this is a totally different topic than what we're talking about, but that's all right. (laughs) That's how the real world works. Applying it to witchcraft. It's not about knowing, oh, this crystal can be used for that, or this herb can be used for that. And having all that information on the top of your head, there might be some that you use all the time and you learn it. It becomes like second nature, but being able to know where to find that information is what's really important. And to get back to what we're talking about, that the fear of failure, don't let it hold you back from being bold. And actually, if you think about it, being bold is doing things, being daring in the face of failure. It's knowing that failure may happen and doing it anyway. The last thing that some people might find it difficult to be bold is because they are comfortable with the way things are. They have a good job, they have nice friends, and they have a comfortable routine. So I'm just thinking back to when I left my job for this new job. It was a good job. I was being paid a decent wage. I had good retirement. I had good benefits. I had structure and stability. I was done at four o'clock every day. You know, so I had a lot of free time on my hand and I was tra- trading that for working for 10. So not getting done with work until like 630. So I was losing a lot of my like free time to work on activities. It was a really hard decision to, to give those things up. And I, I literally had a weekend in between the two jobs. And so with the school job, I had all of these plans for the summer. I was going to do all these fun things. And then suddenly I'm in a new job that ruined all of those plans. But the problem was with the school job is that I was burnt out. I didn't want to do therapy. I was going to work and I was trying to find any excuse to not do what I was supposed to be doing. COVID was awful in the schools, is awful in the schools. Every day was like, we didn't know what was happening. Mental health wise, it was a terrible job, but all of the other things, it was a good job. So I had to be bold and be like, okay, I'm giving up all of the stuff that was really important to me to get some mental health back. And you didn't necessarily even know if that was going to be, it was a risk. You didn't know if you were going to be getting that mental health back. So even if it's scary, you know, try to step out of your comfort zone from time to time and take a risk, be bold, try something new. I remember when I moved away from Colorado, that was like, I feel like that was a pretty bold decision. (laughs) Because Mm -hmm. I didn't have a, I didn't have a job. I only knew a few people, some family friends, and I was moving with a friend of mine. So I knew I was going to have at least one person, but we didn't know where we were going to live. Like I remember driving with Erica and our parents drove in a different car and she, Erica was taking her driving turn and I was like scouring housing (laughs) websites, trying to talk to people who would take in two girls who did not have a job and had no like proof that they could pay 
to live there. And so luckily we did end up finding a place to live and it was a great place. The landlord was wonderful. He really took care of the place and cared about us. So it worked out. But yeah, there wasn't really even any reason to move. It was just a decision that I was like, I need to try something else. I need to be in a different place. And I met Dana. So yeah, so it was good. (laughs) And then we moved to Florida. (laughs) Which I guess was also bold because we left all of our friends behind yet again. This time Dana did have, like, that was the reason we moved was for his job. And so there was that stability, but we didn't have any friends or anything like that. And we've made friends again. Obviously there are times when things don't work out, but I think you can make things work out. Like you can figure it out. And if it doesn't, you just go back Mm -hmm. and you realize, and then you learn from that mistake. Yes. (laughs) The failure. All of these challenges and obstacles that come up They're just part of being bold and you just push past them and uh, it's okay. It's going to be okay. Yeah, it's, it's fine. So this episode is brought to you by Thistle and Erica is going to tell us the medicinal properties and I will share the magical properties. Milk Thistle's botanical name is, I don't know how to say this word. Silibum Mariani, nope, Marianum. Silibum Marianum. I like it. (laughs) It is part of the Asteraceae family, and it is incredibly helpful for anything related to the liver. In fact, that is probably what you're most likely to use it for as a liver tonic to help tone and strengthen the cells of the liver. It can be used for a whole range of liver and gallbladder conditions, including hepatitis and cirrhosis. Again, disclaimer, if you have these things, you should see a medical practitioner because thistle alone is not going to cure or help you manage all of the symptoms related to those diseases. I am not a medical doctor. Thistle is also a mild diuretic and an appetite stimulant. You can eat it or take a tonic of it before eating to help stimulate your appetite and then to help things move through your system. It is anti-inflammatory as well, and it also has some antiviral properties. Milk thistle is an active herb. It corresponds with Mars and Jupiter fire and Aries, Sagittarius, and Pisces. It is most used in magic for strength, perseverance, and wisdom, and it also aids in decision-making. One interesting thing is that it is thought to enrage snakes, and I don't know why all of the herbs that we're talking about make me speak about snakes, but here we are again. (laughs) It causes them to fight against one another. I don't know if that's a magical thing, Or if there's like some property in it that makes snakes get enraged. I don't know. Be careful when you harvest it because it can be pokey. It's very pokey. It's also really pretty. It's very pretty. It's got that beautiful purple tuft, but the stem and the, and actually the tuft is pretty spooky, spooky, spiky. (laughs) Spooky. (laughs) Spooky. Spiky and pokey. (laughs) New word. Yes. It's (laughs) spooky. And that is how a bicycle spoke got its name. Somebody was like, this thing pokes and it spikes. It's not true. This is a lie. Do not believe me. (laughs) I'm not a bike doctor. (laughs) (laughs) Enough silliness. Just use the milk thistle for spells for strength, perseverance, wisdom, and making decisions in whatever spell that you like. So for the next episode and for the next week, Erica and I will be looking at our lives through the lens of the three of wands, which comes after the two of wands because of counting. Is that how numbers work? That's how numbers work. (laughs) So if you think about the progression of making plans that we talked about with the two of wands, the next step would be actually taking that first step out the door. So it's about expanding, it's exploration, making preparations, like getting materials and supplies ready, doing whatever you need to do to prepare for that next adventure, whatever the adventure is. It could also be about following up on new clues or new leads towards what you're trying to do. Anyway, it's like the next step, taking action towards that plan that you've created. It's your turn. Oh, wait, I forgot to say, I forgot to say the last part. That's probably what you were waiting for. That's what I was waiting for. I know, I know. (laughs) So if you would like to share a story about the three of wands with us, please send us a voicemail to we listen at talkwitchcraft.com. You can find out more about this episode by going to mumblesandthings.com slash blog slash 06066 and join us next week when we talk about 
being childlike. Make sure that you are subscribed so that you are notified about each new episode and help other witches find this show by leaving us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also find us on Instagram at Mumbles and Things. If you have any other tips to add, tell us about it in the Talk Witchcraft Forum in Mumbles Academy. Don't forget to share this episode with your witchy friends and followers. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Goodbye. trying to process what I want to say. (laughs) Processing, processing. Now I'm thinking about thinking, so it's not working. We'll just move on.